thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. I, I know about two people in this room, so uh, that's a testament, I think, to the speakers that have come before me uh, who have made this event possible. Uh, I'd also like to thank Sydney Hamilton, who, um, when she approached me about this event, said, Rick, uh, we're doing a creative morning session. Uh, it's on the theme, ugly, and I thought of you. I said, thanks. Said, oh, no, no, not. I mean, it's really about your work at the University of Colorado. Again, thank you, Sydney. Um, and uh, she got a little bit more into it and said, I really think it's about the material use and some of the things that you're doing with the, the products that a lot of people would deem ugly. And so, you know, the obvious thing here to say is that the creative process is an ugly process, and we're part of that ugly process too. So I'll just get through that obvious kind of piece and say, you know, we, we have a messy process in our studio, like many of you creative people have in your studio, where drawings kind of get put out and they're not the prettiest thing in the world, and sites that we get are these sort of blight sites or brown fields that aren't particularly attractive. Our studio environment um, doesn't look like a very professional environment. We tape things out on the floor to give students a sense of scale and get us into the idea of, of what space and space making is. Um, the drawings, have to come a long way because a lot of our students have never done a professional drawing before, so these red lines that we do aren't particularly attractive. Uh, engineers and architects that volunteer their time come in and actually give the students a lot of notes and a lot of feedback. The black lines that you see here are the things they did right. The red lines are the things that they did wrong. Uh, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a creative and ongoing um, process. And the building sites that we envision there is a time before they actually come to final fruition that you have a difficult time kind of seeing through all of that drywall mud and materiality and you really do wonder sometimes if it's going to be um, the, the space that you envisioned it or the space that we kind of envisioned it. And so again the obvious thing is to give you the definition of ugly and then sort of tell you how it was used in context. But I think the important thing here is that kind of idea of thought. And when you look at the idea of thought, you notice that that term ugly is subjective. And subjectivity in architecture or subjectivity, I think, in creative fields, it's a difficult thing, right? It's a difficult thing that gets us into trouble with our clients. It extends deadlines. It's a way in which um, we sometimes don't get our ideas through. Because some idea that you may have is very different than the preconception that maybe the person that you're selling to has. So that subjectivity, I think, is something that I want to really sort of speak to today, more so than the creative process maybe being ugly. Uh, my pants today, right? Not particularly attractive pants. I've had them for 15 years. I think they're beautiful. I see students in them. I see work in them. I see every project that I've done from the different colors of the drywall to the way in which you know, the tears happen through, unfortunately, sawing in a non-OSHA compliant way, where I almost you know, saw through your leg. But you know, the reality is that that subjectivity is something that um, we have to think about getting around. So I'm going to table that for a second and just tell you a little bit about Colorado Building Workshop and Design Build Bluff, the two organizations that I'm involved in. So Colorado Building Workshop is a, a organization that is sort of a subset of the University of Colorado Denver. It's a design build program and it's run through the Masters of Architecture program. We get students out into the field, not for the purpose of training them to be contractors, but for the purpose of really giving them empathy for the trades. They're going to design something that somebody else is going to build. And some of you jewelry designers, right, might actually build your product, but for us as architects, we have um, this interesting communication piece that we put on the table, these drawings that are supposed to tell us or tell somebody else how to build our buildings. And oftentimes we do that really poorly. Uh, we don't really understand materiality, we don't understand scale or proportion, and so it's very important for us, I think, uh, in an education environment to get students out into the field and to work with some of these people. So these are some of the projects that we've built locally. Some of them are right around town, up in Boulder, uh, Waterton Canyon, Lamar Station, which is one of the new light rail stop. And I'll talk a little bit more about a few of these projects. I don't have time to go through all of them. But uh, these are some of the projects that we go out into the field and, and build with the students. The students have to do all the working drawings. They have to submit to the city. They have to meet with the client. And they ultimately have to build 95% of this, this work. 
Uh, we also work in collaboration with Design Build Bluff at the University of Utah, where we design a home for a Navajo family every fall. And in the spring, we go through the process of interviewing those clients, and then in the fall, the students live in residence, uh, much like you would uh, study abroad program. Uh, and they, they go down there and, and actually construct the work. So we serve the public, and in many ways, our clients are old, our clients are young, uh, our clients are communities like in Ridgeway that needed a performing arts stage for uh, their music festival, and sometimes our clients aren't even people. In this particular case, birds for a pavilion that we did down in Waterton Canyon. We work through a very collaborative process. It's very different than maybe an architecture firm that has a principal that makes the decision and he or she has the final say on everything. We have anywhere between 15 and this year 28 students in the program and they all have equal voice and equal value. And I think this is one of the things that's the key to maybe some of the success that we're seeing. So they have to meet with consultants like Chris O'Hara from Studio NYL and throw their ideas out around the table. Individually analyze sites and begin to think about how they're working in the environment and then come collectively talk about those ideas with one another. They meet with the clients that ultimately have a lot more knowledge about the environment that they're going to be building in than they do, so it's important that they listen really well, whether those are individuals or community meetings. Uh, and then come back around and collectively synthesize those thoughts. So the research becomes analysis, the analysis becomes synthesis, and that synthesis, you know, ultimately through even researching some pretty boring engineering stuff, uh, gets to a point where we come to some core principles. And this, for me, is the key to eliminating that concept of subjectivity. And I'll get back to it in a bit, but just in your own discipline, you probably have those principles or those ideas that you can talk about, that verbal narrative that you can give to your client that doesn't necessarily give them an idea of whether it's ugly or whether it's pretty, but it becomes performative. It becomes a way to talk about something through uh, a discussion or a dialogue that maybe isn't so much about how something looks. So we really focus on things that are, in my mind, important to architecture, the context and environment in which we're building in, the program, which means essentially what the needs are of that particular individual or community, uh, structure that keeps it held up, the material that puts it together, and then how light comes into a space, which is in many, I think, architects' minds, our paintbrush is the light. So what we do then is this sort of process that maybe Joshua Prince Ramos would call hyper-rational architecture, where we're looking at our own particular agenda and how that fits into the constraints of the client. How do you really start to make sure that you meet the needs of the people that you're serving, but at the same point in time, you have a creative agenda. You have something that you actually want to be able to fit into that. And how do you get them to buy off on it? I, I moved into building from practice and teaching from practice because I was really getting frustrated with the creativity aspect of it, that I didn't really feel like I was being able to build some of the things that I wanted to build. And from a client perspective, I was trying to figure out how to make that work. So I, I think the breakthrough for me was to begin to understand that it's really about meeting their agenda and their needs first and proving it to them in a verbal narrative way versus an image or creative way so that they can't really disagree with you on that. If you can outline their needs, if you can say, this is about you know, light guiding experience, or you really want to live in your books, or you really want um, to start thinking about how you can create privacy for a family of six, if we can prove to them that our work does that, they're more apt to follow us down a more creative process. And that really comes to this idea of diagramming and how we can diagram those ideas in a more abstract way for them so that they can see them not as material and oh, I don't like that material or I don't, I don't like that idea uh, as a, a way in which it kind of comes out in, in color, but in a more abstract way, start talking about how these spaces can be programmed or how this creative act can be handled um, in a less subjective way. So we do this for every project, and it's part of the process, along with selecting materials that we think are appropriate for that. And those materials, because we have no money, are usually really cheap and really ugly. Uh, it's the dirt from the ground or stuff we found in sometimes dumps. Uh, and you wouldn't sort of believe that some of these buildings maybe come from that. 
and we definitely don't want to be building things out of trash, so we have to analyze the difference between something that has a performative quality that can be useful and something that can't be useful, something that's not um, perhaps uh, performative or isn't going to last over time, it isn't going to be durable. So we do lots of mock-ups. Uh, this is rammed earth, which is the process by taking dirt and compacting it into forms. It's used in Nepal a lot. Uh, Arizona has a tendency to use it quite a bit. We work down in the Utah desert, so it seemed logical to use what was free, which is pretty much the soil that the buildings are standing on, and compacting it into forms, testing different colors, taking it to labs and seeing if it holds up, and then um, really pulling that form work off and starting to see not only how it works as an aesthetic quality, but more importantly, how it performs. And this is an example of looking at performance in a building where you can say to a client, yeah, that heavy mass dirt wall that's from the ground, it's actually going to store heat and re-radiate it off. And this particular building stays a constant temperature between 62 and 85 degrees year round without any secondary heating. Uh, when a client sees that, there's, I think, a more likelihood to let them paint your walls with dirt. Um, we go through this process of really studying different models, and then we have to go back and actually show them that and prove to them in a very abstract way again that these ideas are going to hold up. And that process then essentially whether it's coming from an individual client or whether it's coming from uh, a town meeting where we have to convince an entire town like we did in Ridgeway, uh, ends in this idea that we're embracing that ugly in the design process but we're really trying to dismiss it, um, and beauty for that matter, in the final product. And that beauty will actually come out of a rigorous study of analyzing and beginning to understand how that particular product and how that building performs through that dense kind of layering, taking all those ideas and smashing them together and making sure every decision you make can meet that criteria on every single level all the way through. So uh, I'll start with the project that um, we did down in uh, down at Lamar Station, which is the new light rail stop along the West Line, and Metro West Housing did a project right behind it, which was uh, mixed income housing for people that really wanted to be close to light rail. And the key sort of idea here was bar grate. As weird as that sounds, and for those of you who don't know, it's the metal that you walk over on your way into some of these buildings to knock kind of snow and mud off your, your feet, Bar grade is one of those things that uh, isn't particularly attractive, right? Most people don't you know, look at bar grade and say to themselves, wow, I want to make an entire building out of that. So we analyzed this, and it wasn't an easy decision to come to. But the, the client wanted this idea of dynamic transparency, and they wanted it to fit into the site. So we had an existing site, and that site had a bridge. And the bridge went across to a Head Start program that was going to link it. And we had a building in the background that was for the residents themselves that they needed to be able to see people in the classroom. So how do you make something that's at the same time transparent and opaque? And we just went through dismissing the idea of what we thought was ugly or what was pretty and looked at the performative quality of how can you see through something and also make it opaque. And the source is a great example of that, right? Metal studs generally seen as being fairly ugly. You look at it in one direction, you can see right through it. You look down the hallway, you start to see the names of everything, and it's completely opaque. Bar grate performs in that same way. But it's also durable, vandal resistant, and when you get water on it, it rusts and starts to look like this. So we opened it up so that they could see into it, and we aligned the building so that from a transparency standpoint, they could actually see all the way to um, the, the area where the, um, <laughs> the, the people are sitting to actually view this classroom because it's in a rougher maybe part of the neighborhood and it's definitely prone to have people um, you know, come here and hang out that shouldn't be hanging out in it. So we needed that transparency to come through. We looked at the way that it played with light and we thought that was really fantastic. And then ultimately we tried to make it load bearing. And for those non-architects uh, in the room, which I think is most of you since I don't really know anybody, uh, is that, that this project was really meant to try and stand up by bar grade and bar grade alone. How can we make it all the vertical bearing members so there's no columns, which gives it a kind of incredible lightness, 
And then ultimately, because this is a classroom for urban farming, this is something that's going to teach those residents about food and show them how to grow their own food, how to process that food, and in certain instances, how to cook it. We needed to be able to run this gutter down the backside in our mind and have the building perform by collecting the water into a drainage area. That drainage area also has a hose bib for washing your vegetables. And then all of the waste from that water, either off of the roof, would pick up the content of the iron, pick up the content of any of the washed sort of vegetable, and then feed an herb garden on the end so that they could have this you know, herb garden that grows as well. So we did a finite point analysis, which is a fancy way of saying we wanted to make sure the building stood up with the engineers, because we were using it as a load-bearing skin. And then the students got out in the field and built it. And they literally had to do all of the concrete. They did all of the tack welding. We had a professional welder come in and do all the structural welding. So don't worry, you can, you can go out there, right? We didn't weld at all. Um, we built it on the ground, and then we took 12,000 pounds and lifted it up over our head, which is a scary moment for any teacher, right? This is where you lose sleep, especially when some of your students are wandering around underneath it. That hard hat's not really going to do much. Um, pulled the columns out from underneath it, oh, and uh, got the whole thing to stand up. There's a little bit of cross bracing that has to happen, but we really, I think, in the end, were able to achieve that real open, huge cantilever. It's a 22-foot you know, cantilever in one direction and 18 in the other. And then had that gutter feed the, the space. Mobile classroom cart that they can move around. But everything's built out of bar grade. It was one material. We compressed it down to a singular idea. And when we presented it to the client, I think they were lukewarm at first. But when we talked to them about the performative qualities of it, they loved it. One of them commented, it definitely is a building that says, don't drink your 40s here. And that's exactly what we want. Uh, and in the end, they were really excited when it was built. They love it now. Uh, and I think, for the most part, we got a building that will last a very, very long time. It's durable from a vandalism standpoint and meets that performance criteria. And the herbs took off this summer. It was really amazing to see how big they were by the end. So uh, apparently, the gutter works. The next project's down in Waterton Canyon. And the Waterton Canyon project's an interesting one because um, it is meant for bird banding. And this was definitely one of those clients who was set in their mind aesthetically about what they wanted it to look like. You know, they envisioned this little log structure with a gabled roof. And thank goodness the fire department said, you can't be made out of wood. Uh, the building department said, it's in the floodplain, and it can't have any walls. So those are fun challenges to actually have. Those constraints breed that creativity. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are very familiar with that idea of constraint breeding creativity. So it was for the, literally for the birds. And they capture birds on site in nets, study them, educate young students uh, about that process or people who are interested in um, bird banding. It's run by the Audubon Society of Greater Denver, financed by Denver Water, engineered by Studio NYL. And what we found in this process was this wonderful moment where the bird bander tipped the bird into the kid's hands after it had been um, cataloged. And those little feet touch down in their hands, and the bird flies off. This really just sort of miraculous moment. And they were doing it without really any celebration to the event. So we cantilevered off the backside to make that event, I think, a little bit more special. Uh, we told them that you really can't have any walls, so it all has to be columns. We needed to be able to keep the project stable, so we started to tilt some of the columns in different directions, and then ultimately found a way to hold that whole building up through these series of cantilevered columns off the ground, sent it to a structural engineer for another finite point analysis, and then to a fabricator using digital technology, and they fabricated all the columns, and we installed them. But you come into this classroom on the left-hand side that's a waiting area up a ramp and into uh, another waiting area, because there's numbers of groups of kids that are coming through at any point in time. Get educated in this middle portion in area six, and then over in seven is the release for the cantilever. And the students went through that process again of building something on the ground because it's a lot safer and craning it into place, doing plantings. But they would have never let us build this, I think, if we would have just gone through and said, here's our design. This is what it looks like. Please accept it. We had to begin to show them that we're going to cut a hole in the middle of your roof. 
And we know that sounds like a bad idea. But if you drain water in one direction, you're going to be putting ice over the entry. If you drain water in the other direction, you're going to be putting it over the cantilever that we all love. If you drain it in the other direction, it's going to go into your outdoor classroom. And if you drain it in the other direction, it's going to go up the slope and back in. So the only logical solution, right, is to cut a hole in your roof and drain everything through the middle and then take all that water and collect it in a little planter so that it filters all of that you know, bad EPDM glue through a series of layers of soil that the civil engineer helped us with and then really take it all the way back and drain it back into the brownfield. So I love this project and part of why I love it is because I didn't take a lot of these photographs. These are the students going back afterwards saying, it's fall, I gotta get back there and take a picture of it. It's gotta be beautiful in the fall. It's snowing out, right? And they're riding their bike in the snow out to take a picture of this and then they're sending me a picture of it, right? You know, like, literally text messaging me this picture saying, you know, look how it looks, isn't it gorgeous? So I, I didn't take any of these pictures. No professional photographers took any of these. These are all student photos. So they're very kind of excited by that. And then you know, to sort of move to the other half of my life, which is building these homes on Navajo Nation. This is a house that we did uh, for a couple that was supposed to look like this. So uh, you can actually get a, a Navajo home kit, believe it or not, right? And these, these home kits are basically a way for us to maybe as a society or as even a Navajo chapter, feel better about the fact that we're going to give you a home. So we give you, give you a home, right? The, the material is generally free, financed through the chapter, and it, it you know, really responds to site, has great you know, front porch space, a lot of outdoor living, um, big windows that sort of open up to this gorgeous you know, exterior desert climate that they have. So they had this pile literally sitting on the site, uh, of materials, and they said, we have all of this material, um, you know, we've cataloged it. I never thought I'd ever show this image to the public, so I'm sorry for how blurry it is, but we cataloged all the materials and said, you know, what are we going to do with this? We've got this pile of trusses, we've got all this wood, and the only thing the client said is, I don't want a white man's house. And I have this view, it's a gorgeous view of Monument Valley, uh, I want to be able to live in my environment, I want a giant front porch, what can you do? So. The naive architects flipped the truss upside down, right? Which is a really bad idea. <laughs> there were a lot of bad ideas on this project, but it turned out really nice. Um, you flip the truss upside down so that everything works opposite, which means now you have to hang everything. And you make the roof collect water, and you go through that process of coming up with all of those ideas. And again, ugly process, right? It is not pretty. We're having design discussions behind the scenes, but the client never sees this. We don't show them this process and let them pick. We're the critics, we're the creative ones, we're the ones that actually get to make that decision. And then we're gonna to present to them what we really think is the best idea. This is danger area, because this is a subjective area where somebody who's not trained in the profession might be able to come in and pick a roof that they only see one aspect of it. They don't see the context, they don't see the light, they don't see how it's gonna change the structural implications. They're just seeing it from straight form. So as professionals, as you guys are creative people, you're juggling all of those things. Like, how are they going to work together? And my advice to you is to really use that expertise to show one or two schemes that perform versus showing them all of the schemes. So we eliminated a few, and then we basically told them, like, look, we're going to, it's a little blown out, but we're going to take the roof off the top, we're going to flip it upside down, we're going to put it on, you know, your house, and we're going to give you something that really opens itself up. It collects water, so you can use that water. We're going to even give you this crazy front porch swing, right? So you can swing out over the landscape. Uh, and we're going to do it using all of the materials that you have on site. We're going to analyze it for sun, so that big roof actually becomes a way to shade and create shadows and comes over the top so that in the summer you're blocking all that sun and you're not overheating the house. And in the winter you're letting that sun in to what ultimately became a compressed earth block floor, this sort of thick mass floor that collects that heat. Then we're going to kind of lay it out so that you do have a place to escape the heat and we're going to build it all out of straw bale so that lower left space is their bedroom. It's a straw bale core. Put all the services along the top so that all your mechanical electrical plumbing for the most part runs in that northern side where heat loss is usually kind of coming out. Now the heat has to escape through all of that. And then we're going to make sure, right, this is another really bad idea, make sure that that roof doesn't touch any walls. We're going to float it. 
So we're going to hang it all off of columns, which means that we have to put all the stuff up first. We have to thread the columns, thread the trusses through. Then we have to um, build basically underneath that, create this giant canopy, put the straw bale under it, give them a beautiful view to Monument Valley, and float it so that there is glass 360 degrees around the outside of this house. And you can see right through it. And from the inside, you got that great view. Reduced the overall square footage by 200 square feet from the original home, but gave them an extra about 400 square feet of deck. So now they've got this great wraparound porch. None of the glass actually has to be load bearing, right? Because the columns are doing it. So now the glass can miter to the ceiling. And your eye sort of slips past that. And this giant, heavy roof is now upside down on the house. All compressed earth block floor, recycled cedar that we found um, from a, a house up in uh, Idaho. And you can see right through that, that house. It literally floats at sunrise and sunset. Another kind of crazy idea that we had that was going on at the same sort of time was we're meeting with this, this client, who a uh, wonderful Navajo lady, who wanted to live in her books. She said, I'm an academic poet. I'm an academic, um, Navajo academic. And I really want to live in my books. And I want to reflect the landscape. I want my building to really be a part of that landscape. So we found some spandrel glass that was misordered from a skyscraper mid-rise building in Utah, which is an opaque reflective glass and said, instead of kind of reflecting the landscape and the materials, we're literally going to reflect the landscape. We'll let the house be a, a mirror, essentially. And we're going to make her live in her books. We're going to give her a house that's just one giant bookcase. And she's hopefully going to love it. So we presented the idea of a 50-foot long bookcase that's eight feet tall, that had her bed in it, that had her kitchen in it, that had her bathroom in it. And we presented an outside twisted roof that opened up to a ridge that she used to sit on as a kid, and a tree that she used to love to read under. We twisted that roof. Um, another kind of bad idea, because it creates a flat spot, and there's problems there. But the great part about working with students is the naivete of what they have in their mind makes you question things that you normally wouldn't do as a professional. And then we generally find a way to do them. So clad the entire house in spandrel glass and created this bookcase all the way along the inside. She can live in that bookcase then. Built the project, took some old windows, even took the frames off of them and found new ways to tape them to the side so that you have mullionless glass and she really can feel like she's sitting out um, under the tree. The tree's over here on the right hand side and eventually we cleaned up the site. And then gave her this, this bookcase. So she's got all of her books in it now. Her bed's in it with a little window at the foot of her bed so she can read and look out at Navajo Mountain. Her bathroom you have to walk through the bookcase to get to. A little slit there as well, so she's showering kind of out in the environment, which she was not shy about at all. And then gave her the little reading window at the end, totally stolen a detail from the Museum of Contemporary Art here to make that glass happen. And she can sort of read out underneath it. And then the whole outside of the building is in this spandrel glass, right, that reflects the environment and gives us an ability to not necessarily see the house, but the hope was that you would actually see the landscape instead of seeing the house. So the windows are taped glazing, basically. On the west side, which was going to be the hottest side anyway, it's almost completely clad in that glass so that she's not overheating that really small house. And then the final project I'm going to show you today is the one that we just um, we finished last year. And that's a house that, again, was inspired by something that the clients showed us but didn't say. So we were reading our clients, very quiet clients, through understanding what they had done in the landscape. They had already built this shade structure. And by building this shade structure, they had told us a lot about how they wanted to use the property. It opens to the view. It's closed off to the south sun. It has this vertical slatting that was an affordable way to do a screening that would keep the heat off of them. So we just tried to elevate that a little bit and created uh, what essentially is a huge shading screen on the outside of the house. And that was presented to them through this idea of defining their public spaces and then really protecting it from the sun, both on the east and west through vertical louvers, and then on the south and the top through sit panels and a double skin system. And then getting into really, again, opening up that exterior space, allowing them to live in the landscape. Pretty simple floor plan, office, could be used as a bedroom, main bedroom, and then a giant living area 
huge patio, and the building really mimics what they had already done. SIP panel construction, sometimes even in the design process, you're pushing the tools beyond what they're supposed to do. We clad the whole house in a recycled aluminum and then used the cedar rain screen to kind of go over the top of that, cut everything down, and now that whole patio looks out to the Blue Mountains and really protects itself from the south, and that's that patio that would look out on it. So it's a, a really open area. Looked at protecting all of the window openings with these little eyebrows that come out over the top. And then on the interior, try to use some of that recycled wood to define some more private spaces and then do really fun details like hiding the doors you know, in them. So you wouldn't normally see that, but you can actually hide those doors in, in the space. Gave them some built-in desks where some of those apertures pushed all the way into the house so that you can have a little office space. And when we were on the east and the west, we pushed through with aluminum. On the south, we pushed through with wood. And the cladding basically inverts itself. So a little dark, but um, I would basically close by saying that I think it's important, you know, as we go through this creative process, to be really careful about engaging too much of the subjectivity with the clients and allow yourself to think about the performative qualities of the act that you're creating so that you can sell your ideas in a way that meets their needs and gives you a little bit more creative freedom. And if that ugly process is to happen, let that ugly process happen by showing them the analysis of the work that you're doing and how that actually feeds the end concept and keep that stuff in the studio, right? Keep it away from uh, their eyes so that they're not critiquing that or seeing that. And then you can really open yourself up to these really what I think are fantastic ideas uh, where I'm really listening not to myself a lot of times but to the students and what they want to do. So there is a great young creative group that I found kind of coming up. I hope you're seeing that. I hope you're listening to them. And I hope in the end you guys really have the ability to embrace that, that ugly piece of things in the studio itself and hopefully not show the world, you know, too much of it, but show them creative solutions to things that other people might have preconceptions about being ugly and making them uh, more beautiful. So thank you for your time. Oh yeah, I mean, this is by no means a repeatable model for them to start to duplicate, right? I don't think we're under any illusions that any of the homes that we are doing are going to solve those problems. There's a wonderful design build program by the name of Rural Studio down in, uh, uh, in the south that, um, out of Auburn that does things that are really, I think, more appropriate to that repeatable model. But our model is so labor intensive, things like straw bale construction, rammed earth, are extremely expensive and because our labor is free, the students are willing to kind of donate their time to these projects, it's a much easier way to get away with some of that stuff. So the cost of a lot of the projects that we're doing would be way more expensive than uh, could ever be sort of repeated. The Lamar Station project was a $50,000 budget. They, one, didn't think we were going to finish it. They, they said, we were making contingency plans for you the whole way. Never thought you'd hit your budget, never thought you'd finish it. The contractors were laughing that pulled the permit behind. When we finished it, they said it's a $250,000 project for $50,000. You know, these homes are sort of the same thing. That rammed earth wall may cost $50,000, and our entire budget for that rammed earth project that I didn't show today uh, was about thirty five dollars for the whole project. So this was done for about thirty. dollars The upside down truss house was done for about $30,000, but the labor was a, a huge amount of that. Now, the material for the kit home, we used a good portion of it. We didn't use the siding. We used all the lumber. Uh, and the things that we didn't factor in were the straw bales and some of the natural plasters that we used, and then the compressed earth block in the floor. But all the framing, all the walls, all the trusses in the roof, uh, that was all part of that kit house. And we didn't use the asphalt roofing either. We used a different type of roof to collect the water. So we, over the time, have sort of started to build maybe a little bit of a reputation so that we have a backlog. But early on, it was anybody who would let us build something for them that seemed like we could build it in a short period of time. The Lamar Station project and the bird banning thing were done in three weeks. 
So we have to be able to build those projects in a very short period of time. The houses are all done in 16 weeks. And to date, there's only been one house that didn't make that timeline. Uh, so we really have to think about the scope of things. But we really try and target not-for-profit organizations, uh, people that are really interested in the environment, arts, and education, because we really don't want to take away from the profession, and we want to make sure that we're helping people that are helping other people. So now this next project that we're doing is for Colorado Outward Bound, which is a, a not-for-profit organization that does outdoor education in Leadville, Colorado. And this semester, we're going to be building 14 cabins for the staff members and instructors of Colorado Outward Bound up in Leadville. And it'll be heavily prefabricated. We'll have to go up there in the winter and build some stuff. But um, it really is about hitting that budget. We need about 30 to 50 to make it work right. And we need a project that we can do in a shorter period of time. I, I wish I knew where we got most of them from. But believe it or not, sometimes they just call. We fight. Five-hour fights. That's what studio is. I mean, it's, and it's great. And I, I think Joshua Prince Ramos talks about it, and you know, his firm, or Rem Coolhouse, talks about it you know, at OMA. When you hear them speak, it's, it's really not that much different. The fight just needs to be between you guys, right? So that when you get in front of that client, it's laser-focused and it meets the criteria. But what we found is that if you can use the words as an insulator against personal attacks, you're critiquing it based on the words, not based on somebody's idea. So if you know, Bob you know, brings something to the table and Kate's telling him it's ugly, that's not, that's not okay. We don't play by those rules. You bring something to the table, we have the words that are performative words that we're trying to meet, and we start talking about how does it work in context? How does it work in the environment? How does it work in structure? Does it hold up to all those? Are there ways to make that idea better? And normally studio is this individual process in an architecture program where you sit at your desk and the, you know, critic comes around and gives you some feedback and then moves on to the next person. But what we've sort of set it up is, is just five hours, starts at 12.30, right, ends at 5.30, 6, 7 sometimes, and we just put all the ideas on the table and it's exhausting, but we just go through it and beat it up and beat it up and try and run it through that process. So um, we found that that way, having those words helps stabilize it and minimizes hurt feelings. They're always going to happen, right? Yes. In certain instances, the outdoor pavilions are great um, because uh, we're only collecting that water for a moment, and it's ultimately returning back in Colorado. So the Lamar Station project, it drains off the roof into the wash basin, from the wash basin into the herb garden, and then the herb garden is a hole to the ground. So it goes right back in. So we're not actually retaining it. We're just letting it pass through. Same thing with bird banning. Uh, Navajo Nation is its own sovereign nation. It has no codes. It has no building department. And so from a legality standpoint, we don't have to worry about it there. So to this point, we've gotten around it. If we were collecting water in Colorado for use, um, we would definitely have to be careful about that, right? Uh, those, those laws are changing, and I hope that they continue uh, to change. But I guess we're privileged in that we're sitting on the continental divide, so we have all that water. I'm not in Nebraska. <laughs> No, I don't know that there is. Um, I, I hope what we're doing is we're sort of starting a creative process, right? Or a process by which we can elevate architecture and move it forward. I, I'm not really interested in architecture that's, you know, regurgitating somebody else's sort of ideas or is magazine architecture that happens to be like we saw this on the cover of the magazine and we want it to look like that. So right off the bat, that's out the window, right? Like you can't bring a precedent in and be like, that's pretty, and I want to make it look like that. We can analyze those precedents. We can begin to understand how somebody else is doing a project and why they're making those design decisions, and those might translate. But you know, for us, the recent publicity and the magazine architecture that we've achieved, I feel really good about because I know that it's through a creative process and not through one where we were copying ideas and trying to be the latest trendy thing. What we were really doing was trying to make it perform and serving the client first. And you know, for that, I think there's always going to be a market. If you're serving your client and at the end of the day they're happy, that's great. And what we found is that the majority of clients couldn't picture that. The bird bander cried the day that it opened. She did not want to do that probably project when it started. And I think she was very hesitant, but she trusted the students. 
And that's one of the things that we can get away with, right? It's a student project, you're getting a lot of value. Like, a lot of us don't have to go through the rigors of an architecture firm that's paying somebody. Uh, and she said, I, I just couldn't even think that it could be this beautiful. That space is just unbelievable. And the same thing with the Navajo clients. They, we haven't had one yet that said, this is just terrible. Like, I mean, we, we'd like to return it. So uh, that's good. And I, I think that means that we've met their goals. And whether you guys think it's ugly or not, or you know, a magazine thinks it's worth publishing or not, is coincidental to me. Uh, I honestly hadn't really even sought that kind of publication for a long time. I was always more concerned about the people that I was serving. And I was serving the, the students, and the students are serving the client. And if I can teach them to serve the client, and ultimately the client's happy, then everybody wins, in my mind.